folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. I have a verse in mind. It goes sort of like this. He that soweth to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. We, we've used this expression, you know, he that sows to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Or, or we talk about <clears throat> in our country jargon, our country vernacular, yeah, you reap what you sow. And that is, not only is that just true between people, that's true according to the scriptures. You will always reap what it is that you sow. And I was thinking about that verse, he that soweth to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. And I, and I believe the Bible, I believe what it says, because I can see the reaping taking effect. There's always, wherever there's a cause... There is always an effect. We have that principle, cause and effect, sowing and reaping. And so I want you to think about that. And I was thinking about this in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. Here's what the Bible says concerning uh, the false prophet who comes in the last days. The Bible says, and, and I've had this misconception all my life about, oh, you know, people getting the mark of the beast, and they're going to hold us at gunpoint, and this is why we should have more guns and things like that, and they're going to drag us all kicking and screaming and tattoo our hand or forehead, and oh, I've got the mark of the beast, and I didn't want it. I kind of thought that's how it was going to be, but I, I'm just looking at the scriptures, and, <clears throat> and I'm looking around at what's going on in the world today, and... I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, uh, Mark of the Beast, sure. Yeah, put, put that right there. Put that inside my hand there. I think that's when it's going to happen. Revelation 13, verse 16, the Bible says, And he causeth all, both, we're going to count, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. That's six. Six t different types of groups of people. Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. To receive. There is a cause and an effect. The false prophet, I think his job is to generate <clears throat> the cause. It's, and what they're going to do is, is they're going to reap what it is that has been sown. They're going to get what it is that, that they deserve. They're going to have the effect of the cause. Cause and effect. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark of the beast uh, or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And that number is 600, three score, and six. I know I paraphrase that a little bit. But I want you to get that idea that there is a cause, and the effect of that falls upon six groups of people, and they're all going to receive a mark, and it's associated with the number 603 scored six. Now, I want you to keep that in mind <clears throat> as we go through what, what amounted to just some, some news items that came across to me this week that people like you have sent me. And it just, I, I just seen a lot of things coming all at once, and I'm going, I, I think I see something a little bit more clearly now. And I want us to examine just some of the weekly news that have happened in light of the scriptures so that we see the cause and the effect of it. And I'm telling you, there's going to be a mark. And a lot of, and I don't see anybody that's going to be fighting against it. I see, I see people fighting against it now, and I think you should, but I think when it comes that time, those who are going to get the mark are going to glad that, yeah, I want that. I want that. That's what I want. And I want you to think about that. Let's look at some stories here. Um, gay couples and gay marriage are the Democratic Party. Many longtime voters support the Democratic Party because of family ties, union affiliation, and the belief that their party made America a better nation. The elderly have found fond memories of how FDR supposedly saved the nation from the Great Depression. Blacks contend that it was the Democrats that gave them equal rights. In reality, it was the Republicans who supported the Civil Rights Act of 1964. With a great percentage over Democrats, union members believe the Democrat Party is America's party, when in reality, unions have nearly bankrupted companies and sent them packing. These same Democrat voters are also socially conservative. They are generally against abortion and homosexual marriage, and they still vote Democrat. Ronald Reagan was able to get a lot of Democrats to vote for him in 1980 and 84 because voters were beginning to see the light. Jimmy Carter, I want you to remember that we brought him up. Jimmy Carter had been a huge disappointment to the conservative element in the Democrat Party. A lot of Democrats saw that their once beloved party had been co-opted by radical elements and they wanted out. The radicalism 
is beginning to fester. Publicly, President Obama has stated that he is not in favor of homosexual marriage. That is beginning to change. First, he is opposing a proposed constitutional ban on same-sex marriage in North Carolina. Now, I'm going to stop right here. <clears throat> so, in other words, the gist of this commentary is that everybody, all these people voting Democrat, most of them are probably what we would call blue dog Democrats, in other words, conservative Democrats. Democrats. They're for some principles of the Democratic Party, but they're against abortion, they're against homosexuality, and especially homosexual marriage. So Barack Obama, it says he's against, he goes to Rick Warren's church uh, when he's running for president. Uh, I'm against homosexual marriage. Not so fast. First of all, he's against the amendment in California, excuse me, in North Carolina. Now let's look at what the article says, and you'll see that the people that are surrounding Barack Obama, and let me just out of fairness say this, George Bush from 2000 to 2008 also surrounded by radical homosexuals in the Republican Party. See, there's liberal, liberal Republicans and liberal Democrats. So look at this. The second tip-off that the President Obama is going after the homosexual vote is the number of visible, hand-holding homosexual couples who attend the state dinner honoring British Prime Minister David Cameron. Tim Graham of Newsbusters reports, quote, The gay magazine The Advocate was delighted to list 15 prominent gays, including Obama bundlers and several journalists. Here's the list for you to ponder if you're still a Democrat and you want to know who someone is. We have Andrew Sullivan, a columnist for Newsweek. Sally Sussman, executive prime Vice President of Policy, External Affairs, and Communications at Pfizer. That's a pharmaceutical company. Chad Griffin, incoming president of the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Stop right here. The president of the American Federation of Teachers. School teachers. School teachers. Teaching little kids. is a homosexual. Okay? Don't think for a second that he doesn't have an agenda. Don't think for one second that he does not have an agenda. He does. That's why he's in that position. Uh, Bradley, uh, let's see here, J John Barry, Director of the Office of Personnel Management, government politician. Bradley Kiley, Director of the Office of Management and Administration. Jonathan Capehart, columnist for the Washington Post. Wally Brewster, Chicago real estate executive and major fundraiser for the Obama campaign. Barry Karras, former HRC board member and an Obama campaign major fundraiser. Tim Gill, founder of the Gill Foundation. Hillary Rosen, partner in the political communications firm SKD Knickerbocker. And the list goes on and on and on. So, I want you to get this. Follow me on this, okay? The homosexual element in America has gone from being in the closet underground. I mean way, 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 way down. You would have to know somebody for a long time and you'd have to really, 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 really know them well to ever know that maybe your next door neighbor or your uncle or somebody in politics or somebody in business was a closet homosexual. Not anymore. As more Americans come out of the basement, come out of the closet, they're now being open with homosexuality, hand-holding, and now, now we have it thrust in our face that there are high-ranking government officials, high-ranking businessmen, high-ranking people in places that should have never been, that are part of this homosexual element. So we have taken, we have taken what God said along with other things, I'm going to be fair, along with other things such as shacking up fornication without marriage and other things, we have taken the base elements of our society, and yes, they've always been around, but we've taken the base elements of our society and we have exalted them to the highest places. So now, now, they show up at a White House dinner holding hands, probably making out in the lobby. I mean, who knows what's going on? But now they're in the forefront. Hollywood actors and actresses, now they're just, they're just no bones about it. Yes, I'm gay. Yes, I'm gay. Yes, I'm homosexual. And, and it's, it's cool now. It's cool to be gay. It's cool to be a lesbian. It's like uncool if you're somebody like me. I've been married to a woman almost 25 years and don't really plan on dating a guy anytime soon. Or ever, for that matter. Uh, let's go to the scriptures. I'm going to show you what happens. I'm going to show you that the, there's always cause and effect. It's always cause and effect. When you take a bowling ball 
and you roll it down the bowling alley, that bowling ball, unless you bowl like me, that bowling ball is going to have an effect down the road. You see what I'm getting at? Pins are going to talk unless you're me, okay? Uh, so that's cause and effect. And so now the ball is rolling down the alley of America. Let's look at the effect. Let's go to the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 14. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and 1 years when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there, and his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. Now, stop right here, just out of fairness. I said this earlier. There have always been people who have fornicated. There's always been people who have had lustful thoughts. There's always been people that were sodomites, always. But every now and then, we get a generation... Well, they just have it in their mind that they're going to outdo every other generation that's ever lived. That was the time in Rehoboam's day. That's the time that we're in right now. There will come a day, the Bible says, such has never been on the earth. So let's follow it up. Verse 23. They also built them high places, images, and groves on every hill and under every green tree. Stop right there. Okay? Because at one time, at one time, America was founded on the Bible, was centered on the Bible. The people just believed the Bible. Christi Bible Christianity was the religion, even though it was state-sanctioned and state-recognized. Bible Christianity was the religion of America. But we have forsaken that, and now we are tree worshipers and ecologists, and, and we worship pagan gods, and we are bringing in New Age and Hindu practices into our church services. Building up idols, people, is what we're doing. Cause and effect. The bowling ball's going down the lane. There's going to be an effect. Now look at verse 24. And there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. In other words, they were doing, there were sodomites in the land, and they were doing just like Sodomites did. They were exactly like the people of Sodom. They were exactly like all the lands, all the people of the land that God cast out before he brought Israel in. I want you to think about that. So there is a cause. All the pagan worship. And, and I'm always going to bring the Bible in on the scene because when we abandon the Bible, when we walk away from the God of our fathers, this is what shows up. So it's no wonder that we are the way we are in this country. So, here's the cause. They've turned to idol worship. They went away from God. They quit reading the Bible. They quit praying. They quit, they quit following after the Scriptures and God's law. They said, we don't want anything to do with it. Don't, uh, don't you dare post that Ten Commandments on that school wall. The federal whatever of teachers, federation of teachers, is a sodomite. I guarantee you he does not want the Ten Commandments in the schools. So that's the cause. Let me show you what the effect is. We move on down to verse 26. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of the king of Rehoboam. Fifth. I want you that number five. Always the fifth angel sounds. The, the beast comes up. Revelation chapter 9. And it came to pass in the fifth year of king Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And I want you to look at what happened in verse 26. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. So number one, okay, uh, all the gold, the financial ruin. Number two, took away all the treasures of the house of the Lord. I'm going to show you exactly. Everybody says, oh yeah, this the, the gold stuff that was in the house of the Lord. Um, yeah, if you think that way, it's, uh, yeah, we are, we are losing our shirt in this country. We're losing all of our money in this country. That is, uh, the sinfulness of America is definitely having an effect upon the finances of America. But let me show you what the Bible means when it talks about the treasures of the house of the Lord. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, 
If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. You know what the, you know what the real treasures of the Lord is? Biblical wisdom. Biblical knowledge. Biblical understanding. Go out in the street and ask anybody a Bible question, and they go, Duh. We don't know what the Bible is anymore. In this. Go out and ask the average church member to quote John 3.16. They can't do it. They don't know what the Bible... We have had our treasures taken away in this country. And by that I mean this Bible. We've had the treasures taken away out of the house of the Lord. Right out of the church. So now they're, they're using uh, all, these, all these other Bibles. There's not, not really a lot of treasure in here, and I'm going to show you something here in a minute. Um, not really a lot of treasures left in the house of God. There's not really a lot of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. You call it, we call it the dumbing down of America. They've dumbed down our school systems. They've dumbed down the American person. They have now dumbed down the churches. Why? Because they took all the treasures of understanding and wisdom and knowledge right out of the house of the Lord. And people, they couldn't quote you scriptures. They couldn't tell you Bible stories. And you know why those are so important? The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, I believe that God wants us to know what's in this Bible because when we have knowledge of what's in this Bible, we can look around and we're going, Wow, that is exactly what's going on in the Bible. But you get, you get ignorant people in the church because of their soft stand on sin. And, and, and you follow me. Here, here we have all these church people that are probably having adulterous affairs. We have people who are shacking up, living together in fornication, in sin, without the benefit of marriage. And they're attending these churches in, by the thousands. So do you think that they're going to take a hard stand against sodomy? Or do you think they're going to just kind of ease it in? Well, we can't condemn us because we're obviously living in sin, so we can't condemn them anymore either. And so God has allowed Pharaoh to come into America and take away all of our treasures. This country, we're in so deep in debt now, we're going to lose everything one of these days. And he's taken away the treasures out of the house of the Lord. That's, that's cause... In effect, you see, see Obama and, and a lot of the liberals, even in the conservative, even excuse me, even the Republican Party, the Re Republican liberals, they're trying to sell this idea. They're going around the country selling this idea that if we just recognize everybody's equality, if we just recognize everybody's, um, you know, everybody's got, e they're all equal in God's sight, and their lifestyles, our diversity. Let's celebrate our diversity. How we're all split up. How we're all different. Let's celebrate that. So they're trying to sell this idea that if you're immoral, why, you should be like a hero to people. They go around trying to sell that idea everywhere, and they're causing Americans to believe them. The effect is we have a generation of people who know not God, we have an entire civilization that is now basing itself upon immorality, including sodomy, and we've lost our treasures. Um, this article mentioned Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter came up in the news this week, and he is like a, the typical, he is the exact thing that I am talking about. I want you to look at this. They interviewed, he's got a, he's got a new book. It's actually a, it's a Bible study. You see, Jimmy Carter uh, was a Southern Baptist. He was uh, going to a Baptist, Southern Baptist church in Georgia. And um, he was, he's a member down, still is, and since he's been out of the presidency, I saw a news thing on him here a while back, he teaches Sunday school every Sunday and stands before his class and holds this little Bible study. So he's got a new book coming out. Let's, let's see what's on Jimmy Carter's mind. Former President Jimmy Carter is a controversial figure here in America. But beyond being known in more conservative circles for his intriguing, sometimes troubling, depending on with whom one is speaking, positions. He has also distinguished himself with his outspoken Christianity. Stop right here. Outspoken Christianity. Um, let me just say that it's a, it's a, different, it's a different Christianity than the, than the one that I'm out speaking about. Okay, It's a different one. I'll show you how. His new book, here we go. NIV Lessons from Life Bible, Personal Reflections with Jimmy Carter. Stop right here. This is, 
I, 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 this is my former friend, the New International Version of the Bible. We used to be friends, and we're not friends anymore. I don't miss you, by the way. I have a, I have a better friend, okay? NIV. So he stands up in front of his Southern Baptist, who at one time you could count on those guys. Mm. Uh, Southern Baptist with his NIV Bible, and he teaches Sunday school, and he's written a book. The Jimmy Carter NIV Lessons from the Bible. Let's see what kind of lessons uh, he has. Uh, some of the former president's own lessons that he taught over the years during Sunday school at Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia. These lessons are meshed together with text from the New International Version of the Bible. The Huffington Post senior religion editor Paul Brandy's Rashenbush started the conversation by asking Carter if God wrote the Bible. Stop. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, the first thing, first thing a Bible Christian has got to get settled is, did God write the Bible? Did God write the Bible? Okay, here we go. Here is Jimmy Carter, the Sunday school teacher's answer. Quote, God inspired the Bible, but didn't write every word in the Bible. Stop right here. He inspired the Bible, but he didn't write every word in the Bible? That's, that's not, where, where did he get that? He, he didn't get that from, he didn't get that from the Bible. Because if I go to Isaiah, chapter 6, I see something. If I go to Jeremiah, chapter 1, I see something, I see the same thing. I see God opening Jeremiah's mouth, Isaiah's mouth. I see God opening their mouth. And God said, I'm going to take my words, not my, not my breath. I want to take my words and put them in your mouth so that when your mouth opens, my words are going to come out of your mouth. Jimmy Carter didn't get his. Where did he get that from? Where did Carter get the idea that the Bible was God's thoughts, but it wasn't God's words? Well, number one, he got it from the NIV committee because that's what they believed. He got it from all the Bible scholars that have now infiltrated the Southern Baptists, the Nazarene, the Free Will Baptists, the Independent Baptists, the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, the Presbyterian, the United Methodists. They have penetrated into every single denomination and quote-unquote Christian movement in the world with the idea that the Bible is God's thoughts, but it's not necessarily God's words. Let's see what he says after that. God inspired the Bible, but didn't write every word in the Bible, Carter responded. We know, for instance, that stars can't fall on the earth. Stars are much larger than the earth. That was a limitation of knowledge of the universe or physics or astronomy at that time, but that doesn't bother me at all. It's because you don't care, Jimmy Carter. And you don't study the Bible enough to know that that's exactly what the, if the, if the Bible says the stars fall from heaven to the earth, it's exactly what, it, you just got to know what stars are. President Carter, instead of listening to the evolutionists and the evolutionary astronomists telling you what the Bible really should say, you should just go to the Bible and find out that these stars are angels. That's, that's what you should have done. So here's a guy, he's... Claims to be a born-again Christian. Claims That's how he got to be president. Because we had Tricky Dicky, crooked Richard Nixon in the White House who flaunted all of his uh, weirdness and all of his shady dealings in the White House. And America said, you know what, this guy, he's a born-again Southern Baptist. Let's go vote for him. They thought they were getting a Christian. That's what they thought. Boy, were they wrong. Uh, and then, it, then they asked the billion dollar question here. When it came to addressing homosexuality, a contentious issue in many Christian circles, Carter talked about his historical nature and delved into his views on how civil ceremonies should be treated. Now, let me, let me just give you some scripture here before I get to that point. Carter should have read 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That, let, me, let me explain what this means. Scripture, you know what that is? Words. So you know what this verse is saying? It's saying all the words are inspired by God. Carter said, oh, they're not. The Bible's inspired, but it's not the words of God. Boy, is he wrong. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Boy, I think he needs some correction for instruction in righteousness. Instruction. Stop, 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 stop. 
instruction in righteousness. See, we don't know how to live righteously. See, because let's be honest. Let's, we all, all of us, all of us, me, you, all y'all, okay? We all got something in us we don't like. Okay, it's wickedness. We all, we all like to have a little fornication. We all would, wouldn't mind committing adultery. And probably some of you wouldn't mind being a homosexual. See, it's all there. We all got wickedness in us. A lot, lots of other things. Stealing, murders, and debates. and I mean, all the things the Bible says that we already have in us. We don't know how to live right. But the Bible will instruct us on how to live right and what is right. And so what is right? The roles of a husband and wife together, joined together, ordained by God. Marriage is from God. And that's the confinements of the union between a man and a woman. That's how we live righteously. We don't know how, but we allow the Bible to teach us how to live righteously. You see where I'm going here in a minute. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Now Carter is going to answer this question about homosexuality. He's going to sound real scriptural and real religious. Listen to him. Homosexuality was well known in the ancient world well before Christ was born and Jesus, listen to this now, listen to, listen to, his, listen to his apology. Jesus never said a word about homosexuality. In all of his teachings about multiple things, he never said that gay people should be condemned. I personally think it is very fine for gay people to be married in civil ceremonies. The born-again Southern Baptist Sunday School teacher writing a life Bible study from the NIV Bible says, well, if Jesus never said it was wrong, then it must be okay. Where did he get that idea from? You see, I've been reading the King James and in fact, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, This is my former friend. We're not we're not friends anymore. This is my old and my new friend. And I'm going to show you what this says. The Bible that Carter apparently doesn't remember. And then I'm going to show you what this says. And we'll see where maybe Carter got his ideas. Where Rick Warren is probably going to get his ideas. He's, he's probably already there. He's just not ready to admit it yet. Uh, where all these new preachers now are they're going to start endorsing homosexuality and gay couples. It's already happening, by the way. Let's see where they get their ideas from. Let's compare Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17. And the King James says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of Israel, of the sons of Israel. Sodomite, it's a guy that sodomizes somebody. I don't have to describe the act. You get it. Okay? The NIV, you know, Jimmy Carter's Bible says, No Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. That's... See, I guess in their mind, as long as you don't sell it, it's okay. So naturally, you know, if you're not selling it, then you should give yourself in marriage to another man if you're a man. That's, that's Carter's mentality. That's what he just said. Let me read you what he said. I think it is very fine for gay people to be married in civil ceremonies. He doesn't have a problem. He teaches Sunday school and doesn't have a problem in the world with it. He's not alone, people. He's not alone. How about 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24? And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Sodomites. Sodomites are people who sodomize. NIV, 1 Kings 14, 24. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So again, according to the NIV, it's not the sodomizing that's bad. It's that they took money for it. That's bad. Anyway, moving right along with what Carter said. Following this question, let me just let me go back to this. Let me just make my point again. Why is Carter the way he is? Why does he believe the way he does? Okay? Because he has a watered-down Bible that, and a philosophy about this book that says, even if it says it verbatim, I don't have to believe it. And of course, now he's endorsing and probably has taught for years out of a Bible that doesn't even say it. And even if it did, you don't have to believe it in order to be a, the kind of Christian he is. 
Okay, so let's move on. Following this question, Rauschenbusch asked, what about passages saying, slaves, obey your masters? Colossians 3.22. Oh, we're going to look at, we're going to look at that in a minute. Slaves, obey your masters. Do you think there is ever a time to say, okay, we know that we don't agree with that passage, let's get rid of it. This question was particularly timely considering the controversy over atheist billboards in Pennsylvania that utilize this verse to rail against Christianity. Well, the principles that are still applicable, it, it wasn't a matter that the Bible endorses slavery. It was that, and he, he goes on to give all this stuff. Okay, so the NIV Bible, and this was actually used by atheists. They were quoting, I like it, they were quoting from the NIV that says, Slaves obey your masters, and the atheists were saying, See, Christianity is a slavery religion. What was that again, Colossians 3.22? I, I have some other verses that go along with this, but I'm going to look in uh, Colossians 3.22. Um, Let's see what the let's see what my friend the King James says. Now we know what my former friend the NIV says. Colossians 3:22, I guarantee you it doesn't say slaves. It doesn't say slaves because we know what slaves are, okay? We know that. Colossians 3:22 in in my friend the King James, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Servants. Servants. Did you know that a guy that works at Burger King is a servant. Did you know that somebody that works in a car factory is a servant? Did you know that somebody who works uh, as a secretary is a servant? Did you know that middle management, those guys are servants? Did you know that a nurse is a servant? Did you know that, I guess, even a doctor, if he works for a hospital, he's a servant? To the so you know what the word servant means? It's just somebody that's working. It's an employee. That's what it is. And you can be paid to be a servant. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. You know what? You know what? This this Bible is just full of good management. That's what it is. Okay. If you work for somebody and it's their money, then work for them. Don't try to be the boss. You're not the boss. You're not the one taking all the risk. They are. So it's just good management advice is what the King James Bible is getting. It's not endorsing slavery, not for a second. NIV says, slaves, obey your earthly masters. Ephesians, here again, here's, my, here's my, my new friend, my former friend. My new friend, King James says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh. Here it is, Ephesians 6, 5, NIV. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Do what they say, boy. That's the NIV. So this is, Carter says, see, see, the Bible, so, it's just so wrong. It's the, even though it's in there, I don't have to believe it. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But, thank, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you become, oh, I like this, the servants of righteousness. See, I'm freed from sin. And I serve righteousness. I'm not a slave to God. God doesn't say, Mike, do this. Shabang! He doesn't do that to me. He says, Mike, will you do this? Lord, and I say, Lord, I love you. Of course I will. I'll do this. I'll do it the best I can. I may fail. So I'm going to need your help, but I'll do it. I'll do anything for you, Lord. You're my master. Okay? I'm a free servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the NIV. NIV, Romans 6, 17, verse 18 says, Ye have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And some people look at that and go, I'm going from one slavery to another. Why do I want to serve God? And all throughout the NIV, Paul says, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm, Jesus whips me on the back and he makes me do what I, I don't want to do. That's, listen, folks, it's not slavery. Paul was a servant. I'm a servant. When I used to work for a guy in construction, you know what I was? I was his servant. If he said, Hoggard, climb that ladder and paint, paint that up there, I would climb the ladder and paint that. I did it. He paid me. Took care of my family. I was a servant. And it was my job to listen to what he said. That's what the real Bible says. 
cause and effect. And so the cause, we have, we have the Jimmy Carters of the world who not only represent the political structures of the world and their faulty philosophies, but in the same man representing the religious ideas and their flawed philosophies, number one, of the Bible. Uh, yeah, it's, we call it the Word of God, but we don't, we don't really mean that. I mean, nobody except for those nutty King James people believe the Bible, the whole thing, is without error. I mean, yeah, it's, I know it says it in our doctrinal statement, but we're, we're probably going to have that change for too long. And then we have this one. Feminist theologian claims we can't be sure Jesus was a male. Well... See, I can. Because I believe that all the Bible is the Word of God. It's the very words of God, and it was translated right, and He is the Son of God. Let's, let's look at this. A uh, feminist theologian is claiming that Jesus may have been, and now get this, not, not just not a guy, not a girl either. But here we are back again. Jesus could very well have been a hermaphrodite. Dr. Susanna Cornwall, a professor at Manchester University's Lincoln Theological Institute, wrote in a recent paper that the idea that Jesus was male is simply a best guess. She made the comments in response to an ongoing debate in the UK over having women bishops in the Church of England. In a paper titled, Intersex and Ontology, a response to the church, women bishops, and provision. She states that it was impossible to know with any certainty that Jesus did, did not have both male and female organs. Are you kidding? Ugh. On her blog, Cornwall notes that about one in every 2,500 people is born with intersex condition, which means that their body varies from the typical male or female pattern. It's therefore possible that Jesus, in common with many other people whose sex is never called in question, had a hidden or invisible intersex condition. He was a he-she. He, he was a, a dude, a guy with, you know, girl stuff. That's what she said. See, I know who that is. I know who that is. Romans chapter 1, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah, that's the theologians and the scholars and the people who write the dissertations. They profess. They're professors. They profess themselves to be wise, but they're fools. Change the glory of the, in, of the uncorruptible God. By the, stop right here. Just because some nutty professor says that Jesus was a guy in drag or he had both organs, or it does not change the uncorruptible God. He still is who he is, and Jesus was his son. Into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. See, right here. Here it is. Here it is. Right here. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. You pursue this course. You roll this ball down this alley. There's going to be an effect. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Here it is. They changed the truth of God, sodomites, not to have any sodomites, into a lie. Oh, it's, it's male prostitutes. And as long as you're not selling it, it's okay. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affairs. See the word cause there? cause and he caused all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark and for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. see it's specifically mentioning sodomy here or lesbianism homosexuality woman with woman man with man performing that which is unseemly and it's just not natural and it's not right and if you just want to look at nature itself, the procreation of the species determines that those of opposite sexes come together, not those of the same sex. And we all, we all know, we, we get it. Those of you who studied uh, Bible prophecy, those of you who know a little bit about what's going on, you know, you know let's see, uh, the female theologian, Dr. Uh, Cornwall. You know what God she's trying to get everybody to believe in, don't you? Baphomet. The God who is the fusion of man and beast, male and female together, heavens and earth, and all of that, spirits with 
with humans. It's that's what it's all about, people. Okay, that's the God. That, and by the here we here we have Rick Warren. Rick Warren writes in a tweet. We dealt with this a few weeks ago. Rick Warren writes in a tweet. Of course, uh, men are natu perfectly natural for men to act like women, and for women to act like men. After all, God is both. So it's not just the esteemed theologians from the universities. It's the Rick Warren crowds and all of the other, the, the Jimmy Carter people that's going around. Ho listen, homosexuality is the, it's the effect. It's the effect. It's what caused that effect. What it caused all these people to rise up in high places of power. It's the liberalization of the churches, the liberalization of America, liberalization of the Bibles and the teachers and everything else. It's this idea that God's Word is really not God's Word. Even if, and we're going to try to dumb it down as best we can, but where we really can't get away with it, we know we can't, we're just going to tell you, well, even if it says it, you don't, you don't have to believe that. I mean, nobody believes the Bible anymore except for the King James people. Uh, listen, if you, just, if you just stick with the King James Bible... And, and you just decide, you know, hey, this is the Word of God right here. Number one, let God tell you. Don't let me tell you. Let God tell you whether or not this is the right Bible or not. And number two, if you, once you're convinced, stick with it. Stick with it. Don't walk away. Please. Don't walk away. Uh, here's something else. Episcopal Church releases draft of same-sex union rights. Ah, now they're getting ready. You're getting ready. Here, you, you see what's coming, don't you? You see, when you see the bowling ball rolling down the lane... Everybody in their right mind assumes then that pins are going to come crashing down, unless, of course, they're watching me bowl. Nobody assumes that anything's falling when I roll a bowling ball down the lane, I promise you. And so here, here we see it coming, okay? Barack Obama says, oh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not really for homosexual marriage as a candidate. Now he's president, he's going, yeah, let's get him, let's marry him, okay? And we have Jimmy Carter saying, yeah, I think, you know, it's okay. You know, God, God says, Jesus didn't say it was wrong, so therefore it must be okay. And then you have uh, this uh, professor, female theologian, oh, yeah, that maybe Jesus himself was part man, part woman. Maybe he married himself, okay? Uh, and then we have the Episcopal Church releases draft of same-sex union rights. The Standing Commission on Liturgy and Music of the Episcopal Church has released the first draft of the rights for consecrating same-sex unions, although the final draft probably won't be completed for many years. You know what they're doing? They're working on a marriage ceremony, to work, how to word it for men to marry men in the church. Okay? That's what they're working on. Okay? Now, so it just, you know what? The ball's rolling down the lane. Guess what's going to happen in who knows how long, okay? Not only is same-sex marriage going to be endorsed in the halls of government, it's going to be endorsed in churches, in churches like the Episcopal Church, Church of England, probably all these other liberal, what they call mainstream churches, uh, uh, different, different denominations, the disciples of Christ and things like that. Here, here's what's going to happen. Since they're already endorsing it, there's going to be a mandate at some point from government agencies saying, well, these churches don't have a problem with it. So they're going to say to Bethel Church, two guys walk in the door, want you to perform a ceremony. Do the ceremony. Or we'll find you $50,000. We'll put you in jail. Because you have a $50,000 fine to pay. That's what's going to happen. Cause that's the cause now. That's the cause. All this stuff creeping up. The sodomites in the land and nobody's doing anything about it. All the, And sodomy just represents all of the immorality together. Okay? So if, if you're watching this and you're living in sin, either with somebody else or yourself, okay, your sin is going to have an effect on what's going on in this nation. Okay? Cruel authority. So now we take, go from here to this right here. This came out this week. President Obama signs executive order allowing for control over all U.S. resources. I mean, this one hit, it came out, everybody sent me emails. Pastor Mike, Obama signed executive order, and oh my goodness. And some are going, uh, come on, you conspiracy people, you're giving me a headache. This is nothing. I mean, this stuff has been on the books for years. He's just kind of changed some of the wording a little bit. Remember, remember what I said last week, the breach of contract. He's changing. Remember that what the United Christ does, he, he doesn't do away with the law. He just changes them. 
So this new executive order comes out. Everybody says, it's been on the books. Would you guys knock it off, you bunch of little conspiracy whiners? Okay, why is it, why is it there to begin with? Okay, but it's this idea that, uh, and, and, and if we look at here the graphics, we have the Secretary of Agriculture mentioned, the Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Health, Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Commerce, and uh, Food Resources. Wow, that, that just about covers everything. It's a good thing we don't have like a Department of Air. Well, maybe do, maybe we do. Uh, but anyway, it covers everything. So that, and they're just tidying up the language is all they're doing. What they're saying is, and with this new executive order, what they're saying is, is that the president, now, the president, whether there's really an emergency or not, if there is a potential for emergency, if the ball, if somebody is standing up at the bowling alley with the ball in their hand, okay, um, then there's the potential that pins are going to fall. So the government is saying, you know what, even if we, if we just say, that, look, if something really bad can happen, we're going to take over now. They're issuing orders for the Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, Health and Human Services, Transportation, Defense, Commerce, and every, all these other departments to kick into high gear, putting things uh, in place so that when the president, whoever it is, says, go, all of a sudden now the government takes over everything. All commerce, your backyard garden with your five tomato plants in it, government owns it. It's, it's right there, okay? Cause and effect, cruel authority. You say, well, you know what? I'm growing stuff in my basement. They can't find it there, okay? I'll get away with it. Let me, let me, let me just help you with this, okay? If you're one of these... And I try to reach out to you because I think you're my kind of people, okay? I am a conspiracy nut, okay? I believe in conspiracy theories, but I, I try to prove them as factual according to the Word of God. And if I can prove them according to the Word of God, they're real. And I'm with you, okay? You're the one I'm talking to because if, if you're thinking, well, I bought me some guns and ammo. Cost me a fortune, but I've got it and I'm ready. I got a gun sticking out of every window in my house. If they come after me, they're not going to get me. Or if you say, well, I'm going to hide out. We got us a place where we're going to hide out and nobody's going to find us. We're going to be in. We're, or if you're depending on your self sufficiency to save you in that day, I'm here to tell you it won't work. Do you know what the Bible says when, this, when, when, this, when it all comes crashing down? you know what the Bible says? None shall escape. None. How's that working, Pastor Mike? New detail. We, we talked about this, I don't know, was it two years ago, something like that, early on a Watchman video broadcast. I told you they were building some big mega spy center in, in uh, where is it, Utah? Okay. They're building it, funneling billions of dollars into it. Well, now they're telling you what's going on there. New details on the NSA spy center and secrets from domestic eavesdropping operation Stellar Wind. You know that uh, Stellar Wind, that's it's interesting. You know, you know what stellars are? Stellars are stars, spirits, wind. That's what, that's what the word wind is. The word spira means wind, breath, spirits. Okay, he that soweth to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Okay, so Operation Stellar Wind is the NSA's eavesdropping. Okay, you know what the term eavesdropping is. Okay, uh, you sneak up to somebody's house. You're standing and covered by the eaves of their windows and you're listening to a conversation they're having inside of their house. They think it's private, but you're, you're listening without them knowing about it. That's, that's what eavesdropping is. And so we've had to come up with a lot of more creative ways to eavesdrop on people. So here we have Operation Stellar Wind. We've sold to the whirlwind. And here's this NSA. Now this is the National Security Agency, in the, the national one. The CIA is supposed to only operate outside of United States. The NSA says, 
Okay, okay, that's, if you want to go to Saudi Arabia, that's fine. We're going to listen to everything that everybody's doing here in America. Here's uh, some of the data center's purpose. Flown through its servers and routers and stored in near bottomless databases. A, a near bottomless pit. Will be all forms of communication, including the complete contents of private emails, cell phone calls, Google searches, as well as all sorts of personal data trails, parking receipts, travel itineraries, bookstore purchases, and other digital pocket litter, it says. Uh, Wired reports that the data center will store trillions of words and thoughts and whispers swirling on the, you know what a swirl is, it's a swirl wind. Swirling on the web, it states that to those on the inside, the old adage that NSA stands for never say anything applies more than ever. In addition to public website data storage, Wired reports that it will seek out and house information on the deep web. Here's the deep web. The deep web contains government reports, databases, and other sources of information of high value to Department of uh, Defense and the intelligence community, according to a 2010 Defense Science Board report. Alternative tools are needed to find and index data on the deep web. Stealing the classified secrets of a potential adversary is where the intelligence community is most comfortable. Even with data storage and as its pub publicized purpose, Wire reports that an official involved with the program has said, quote, this is more than just a data center. It hopes to be the ultimate code cracking facility. According to another top official also involved with the program, the NSA made, made an enormous breakthrough several years ago in its ability to cryptonalize or break unfathomably complex encryption systems employed by not only governments around the world, but also many average computer users in the U.S. The upshot, according to this official, everybody's a target. Everybody with communications is a target. Every, everybody. You. Okay, and so you bought this software and put on your computer, or you're using a Linux system that has that has a program for it, and you want your home folder encrypted. So you put this encryption on your home folder so that nobody can steal your private data. And with some of you, we all know what that is, don't we? Okay, that's all your little dirty pictures. You don't want anybody to find out. Okay, that's why you got them encrypted on there. Okay, and you think nobody knows what you got doing going. Okay. Well, the NSA knows because they now are telling you they have the ability to crack that encryption. They got it. Somebody else does too. I'll show you who it is in a minute. Uh, let's see here. Inside the facility will consist of four 25,000 square foot halls filled with servers, complete with raised floor space for cables and storage. In addition, there would be more than 900,000 square feet for technical support and administration. The entire site will be self-sustaining with fuel tanks large enough to power the backup generators for three days in an emergency. Water storage. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, electricity. All of this stuff going on. And then the article says this. Uh, Barney says Stellar Wind was far larger than has been publicly disclosed and included not just eavesdropping on domestic phone calls, but the inspection of the domestic email. At the outset, the program recorded 320 million calls a day, he says, which represented about 73 to 83 percent of the total volume of the agency's worldwide interpreters. You know what they're basically saying? We're going to listen to every cell phone call. And by the way, it, practically everybody's using their cell phones now. Text messages, data sent to and from, uh, GPS, your cell phone's a locator. They not only know what you said, they know what you texted and where you were when you said it. And when you took the picture, they knew it. Okay? What you surf it, what, what you buy over the internet, everything about you. And you said, well, <laughs> I'm going to get rid of my cell phone and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unplug my computer and I'll be safe then. Not so fast. Here's another one. Came out this week. CIA chief. We'll spy on you through your dishwasher. More and more personal and household devices are connecting to the internet from your television to your car navigation systems to your light switches. CIA director David Petraeus cannot wait to spy on you through them. Let me stop right here. Let me, uh, let me tell you what little bit I know about the computer world. I just learned this, picked up little bits of information over the years. Okay? Java. Have you ever heard of Java? And I'm, known, I'm not talking about a cup of coffee. A JavaScript, okay? It's, uh, it's uh, a little programming language that's in practically every web browser and most websites will use what's called JavaScripts to get content onto your computer from another computer. That's how the internet works. You know what Java was originally written for? The programming language of Java was originally written for 
toasters and microwave ovens and refrigerators and televisions. It was originally written for the time when personal household appliances would be able to perform more than just toasting, would be able to talk to one another. You've seen them market these new refrigerators. So you close the door, little panel comes up and says, uh, you'll be out of milk tomorrow. Let's fill out a list for you. You probably need it. You know what? Don't worry about it. I, the refrigerator, have already called the market, and they'll be delivering some milk out here before breakfast tomorrow morning. And we go, man, this is so cool. Every... And, and, okay, to all you conspiracy theorists out there, okay, who, you remember when the box, when they changed over from analog television to HDTV, and their conspiracy theorists were saying, it's a way to spy on everybody. I wasn't sure, because a guy had a YouTube video, this was the first year I did, did the watch broadcast, a guy had a YouTube video, and he opened up one of those converter boxes, because not everybody had the new TV, he had converter boxes, he said, look here. I found a spy camera in my, in my box. That's how they're spying on everybody. Well, I looked in mine and there was no camera. So I'm going, this is a hoax. Okay? That was then. This is now. We couldn't have realized two years ago just how right the conspiracy people were in imagining a scenario where every appliance in our house, it's like HAL 9000, go back and watch 2001 A Space Odyssey. HAL 9000 cooks their meals, controls their air, controls everything about the little spaceship that's trying to get to the monolith in Jupiter. They're controlling everything about it, including the two astronauts who are figuring out that something's not right. They try to hide in one of the little external space capsules. You've seen the movie. And they're having a conversation where Hal can't hear them, but Hal has eyes everywhere, and he's, he's reading their lips. And so he knows that there's a conspiracy against the computer, because Hal knows everything. That was Arthur C. Clarke, 1968. And here we are. We have appliances in our homes carrying around cell phones, whatever, that have the ability to spy on everything that we're doing. Everything that we're doing. My lands. I put a, a network security camera in my house last night. Okay? And I told my wife, I said, you know, if we go away, I'd like to be able to check in every now and then, see, okay? Not a bad idea. I woke up this morning and I thought, you know, I am 90% sure that a government computer probably all, and I don't know how to tap into it yet. I'm about 90% sure that a government computer already knows. It has a microphone on it too. I don't know. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. Hmm. Stop right here. Cause and effect. Our wickedness drives us to paranoia. And our government is the most paranoid institution in the history of mankind because the government thinks that everybody's talking about them. Wickedness, cause and effect. The wicked flee when no, no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as lion. You know what? As I'm recording the Watchman video broadcast right now, it could very well be that from the time that I record this to the time it actually comes out on the internet on Sunday, the uh, entire conversation that I'm having probably has already been stored somewhere else. The righteous are as bold as a lion. You know what? I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. For the transgressions of a land, many are the princes thereof. Did you get that? For the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. You didn't think that your refrigerator and your TV and your cell phone and your iPod and, and your computer and your toaster and all of your, your heater device, you didn't think that all of that stuff would be lording over you, but it is. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. 
We look at Second Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse nine. This is God's ability. You see, let's stop here. Remember that encrypted folder that you have on your on your computer. You don't want anybody to see. Okay. God knows what's on there. You can't you can't hide it. God God knows. He knows. You're not hiding it from Him. And, of course, now you're not going to hide it from the devil either. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. So what this verse is saying is that God's eyes can see everything. God sees everything that's going on in the earth. Now remember what Lucifer wants. Isaiah 14, he says in verse 14, I will be like the Most High. That's what he says. Lucifer wants to be like God. Okay, Ezekiel 28, verse 2. Lucifer says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's what he says he is. He, Lucifer wants to be like God. He wants to be able to see everything. But he is not omniscient and omnipresent and all-seeing the way God is. God can just go, I see everything all at once. He doesn't need help. The devil needs help. So he's got a, a place there in Utah. He's getting help. All the appliances running these little computer programs and all these monitoring stations in your home. He's getting his help, people. The defense agency something, DARPA. Okay? You know what DARPA is. It's the Office of Information Awareness. A DARPA program, defense agency program, that believes that knowledge is power. So if we just know, and notice their logo. The all-seeing eye watching the whole planet, seeing everything that's going on. How can you do that? Security cameras and cell phones and refrigerators and microwave ovens that we're going to use and your TV set that we're going to use to spy on you. You're watching us. Well, we're watching you back. Okay? Because the devil wants to be like God. So here's a story that comes up. Um, Dar DARPA director bolts Pentagon for Google. DARPA director Regina Dugan will soon be stepping down from her position atop the Pentagon's premier research shop to take a job with Google, you know, the search engine. When asked what she would be doing for Google, she replied, spying on everybody, you nitwit. <laughs> what, what do you think I'm going to be doing? No, she, she didn't really say that. I, I just made that up. But think about it. The people who want to know everything about everybody in the world, the lady who runs that program, now is going to go work for Google. The people who want to know everything that there is to know about you. And they say there's no conspiracy. I want you to think of the beast for a minute. Okay, we talked about him. Cause and effect. The beast is simply the effect of all the wickedness that's going on. And remember, when there's wickedness in the land, there's many princes over everybody. Revelation 13, the Bible says, The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth is as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and seed and what? Great authority. See, he's going to run the show. You know why? You know, knowledge is power. He is going to have a system in place where he's going to know everything that needs to be known about everybody. And he will have great authority. Then we get to verse 16. He causeth all. One, two, three, four, five, six. Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. To receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy, think of buying and selling. Save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred and three score and six. So think about buying and selling. Okay, now, they're going to control buying and selling, which means that they had to be able to control all the commerce in the world, cause and effect. Okay? The effect is to have everybody's financial dealings controlled. The cause is, well, we've got to get rid of paper money. Everybody, for Years have been saying that. Go all the way back 50 years ago. Got to get rid of paper money because paper money can just be traded everywhere and nobody knows about it. You see, we don't mind doing something for somebody and getting paid in cash, do we? We get paid in cash, that way you don't have to pay taxes on it. And the government says, Man, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that. We'll just take over all the financial stuff. We'll do away with cash. And... Um, 
So anyway, it's being done in Sweden. Sweden can be the first country to go cashless, even as churches are taking cards for offerings. Sweden was the first European country to introduce banknotes in 1661. The article that you see this guy here, you know who that is? That's that's I don't know what's his name, Bjorn. That's the guy from ABBA. And he is saying, well, yeah, I think I think we ought to just go cashless. You know what? That'll that'll solve the bank robbing problem. That'll solve the drug problem. We won't, people won't be selling drugs anymore because they won't have any money. See how it works? They're going to cause and effect. Oh, we have a big drug problem and millions of dollars and people with cash. They, they, they arrest all these drug dealers, right? What they got? They have big wads of cash. Okay? Get rid of the cash, go to electronic banking. They won't be able to do that. Yeah, they will. Cause and effect. Okay? So now, think of commerce. And the number six, or the number 666. Somebody sent me this, Pastor Mike. I got it. I got it. Ellen, uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Sodomite. O open about it. Has a TV show where she came out. Comedian. And everybody thinks she's funny. Now she's a lesbian. And everybody knows she's a lesbian. And nobody's going, oh, that just, oh, that makes me. Nobody's doing that. Everybody's watching her show going, oh, she's so funny. She's so cool. I love Ellen. Oh, look, she's got her girlfriend with her. See, that's how we are. That's, that's what we've turned into in this country. So Ellen does, uh, she's doing commercials now for J.C. Penney. Commercial, merchandising. And a guy sent me this. He said, Pastor Mike, watch the first four seconds of this commercial and you'll, you'll get it. So I looked at the first four minutes of this, the first four seconds of this commercial, and that's what you see. Six, six, six. See, it's, it's getting it here. Got to, got to get it subconscious. See, you'd watch this commercial and go, oh, she's funny. Yeah, she's a lesbian. Yeah, she's funny. You didn't know that subliminally, you were having something planted inside of your mind. That was, and we dealt with this. I mean, this works. Okay, subliminal persuasion. Um, planning ideas in your mind, perception without awareness. You perceived the numbers in your mind, and now a seed has been sown inside of your mind of this number. Look at this. Here's a, uh, uh, an HP laptop commercial featuring Dr. Dre. See the numbers? And it's only up there for like a few seconds, okay? But it's there. Um, a guy down in Florida, one of our followers for a long time, was sending me stuff before I started doing the Watch Me Broadcast, and I had all this stuff, didn't know what to do with it. Now I got it. Look at this. You see it. This big pack. You go to these, what they call these big box stores, and you buy Pringles potato chips. You don't just buy a can, man. You buy the whole crate of it, because you're going to get hungry one of these days. Six flavors, six flavors, six flavors. Look at this one, a tie-down ratchet. It'll hold exactly 666 pounds. Vodafone. Okay, they're marketing it all over the world. Three sixes in a row. That's what that is, people. That's exactly what that is. So planning ideas of 666 in people's minds, getting them to market things, and it all has to do with our sins and our transgression. Remember... That the beast in Revelation 13 is referred to in 2 Thessalonians, and here we go, think about it, because my, my former friend, the NIV, says he's a man of lawlessness. No, he's not. Because my old friend, the King James, says he's the man of sin. You know how sin was characterized in, in the Bible? In different ways, different types. One of them was leaven, okay, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. It doesn't take much, but boy, I'll tell you what, when the, ball, when the ball starts rolling down, it builds up speed. It's also characterized as um, leprosy. Leprosy. It's uncleanness. It, and leprosy starts out in just a little place. But for two, for after a while, it just spreads and it'll kill. It's, it's a slow death is what it is. It just consumes the entire body and you know that you know how that's how sin works don't you okay i found this in the old testament i believe in typology i think god is showing us the future by showing us these stories in the past second chronicles chapter 26 notice this but when he was strong his heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the lord his god 
went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of the incense. By the way, they, that was talking about the king, and that he was not supposed to do that. Only the priest was supposed to do that. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah. He was the king. And said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests of the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. You know what trespass is? You crossed the line, buddy. You crossed the line. You broke the law. Cause and effect. Every sin has an effect, and the abundance of sinfulness will have an abundance of effect. Look at what happened. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. Now verse 19. Then Uzziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up, look at here, in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous. Where? In his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. He had, he had the mark of the man of sin in his forehead. Leprosy. Cause and effect. He got this because of his own sinfulness. And those of you sitting out there, you watch and you, I'm against conspiracies and I'm against the New World Order and I'm against all, yeah, okay. You're also against living right too and you're against the Bible and you're against salvation. Yeah, all the, all the religions are corrupt. I got my own religion. That's your problem. You see, you've even believed the lie that, that some have told that the King James Bible was, it was written by the Rosicrucians. Yeah, Francis Bacon wrote the King James Bible. Yeah, so-and-so said so. No, he didn't. You just, you just like to believe it because then you can just keep doing all your little sins and hiding stuff in your little encrypted folder. Uh, you, you need to be, you need to be, you, you, the, the very thing that you're not wanting, which is a new world order, is exactly what you're going to get. And while you have this scenario that the government forces are going to come in and force everybody at gunpoint and get a mark, get the get the microchip implant. That's what it is. God says it's a lot deeper than that. I'll never go. I think you will. I think you will. I think because you reject this Bible. And you reject Bible Christianity and you reject the salvation that God is offering you right now and you would just much rather keep your sin and your dirty little secrets. I think because of that, when it's time, when it's time, when, when the cause works, it will have an effect on you. And nobody will drag you kicking and screaming anywhere. God himself, God himself will smite you with the result of your sin right here. R read Romans 10. You call our church, you might, you probably get Gary. Gary's a good saint. He's very bold about his faith. And he'll, he'll be checking out at the grocery store and the, the clerk's sitting there. He's real nice about it. He said, would you do me a favor? And the clerk will say, what? He's, when you get home, get a King James Bible out and read Romans 10 and believe it exactly what it says. And he, that's all he'll tell him. So that's what I'm going to tell you. Read Romans 10. I believe what it says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to encourage you to do that because we, uh, we're running out of time. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for helping me. All this stuff came from, came from you. Keep sending it. I get a lot of emails, 150 a day now. I try to read every one of them. I may not be able to respond to every one of them. But I'm looking at them, and I appreciate you. Thank you very much. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.